Good morning. Oh, I just tested my voice and it went ugh. Um, good morning. I have been a city planner for 40 years. I have been my city's planning director for the past 11. My job, literally, every day, is to think what if on behalf of my city on a variety of topics. Today, I'm going to ask the what if that not just impacts my city, but impacts all corners of this country. What if we lived in a community, in a city, where we had a variety of choices of where and how we live? And what if we had those choices in those communities throughout different stages of our lives? Sounds pretty good, right? What gets in the way is we're in the middle of a housing crisis. That is not a profound statement. I didn't just make that up. It's been with us for several years now. In August of 2022, the Urban Land Institute published a study that showed that all 50 states had some form of housing distress. And even though it's across the country, it varies by community and community. These things include recovery from the Great Recession, changes in mortgage interest rates, lack of building supplies, lack of skilled labor, lack of housing, and so on. What this means is there isn't any one solution here. There isn't any one pot of money or program that's going to help us with this crisis. We are going to need a variety of, variety of arrows in our quiver and the willingness to use them if we're going to make a difference now and into the future. So what's going on here? Let's break this down a little bit. It's a simple matter an economic principle of supply and demand. There simply is not enough supply of housing to meet our current demand. So just build more housing. Remember I said this is complicated? It's complicated. Let's start with building materials. So the things that go into building different housing types, brick, wood, glass, concrete, steel. The availability and price of these things are already vulnerable. Mother Nature comes along and throws us hurricanes, tornadoes, and wildfires. And the next thing we know, what was vulnerable becomes wildly unpredictable. Then add a pandemic and changing trade relations with, with countries that we normally had bought building materials from. So what was vulnerable gets wildly unpredictable. Let's dig a little deeper. There's a, a, housing, a house, housing supply issue sorry, that's chain, that is tied to location. What's the cardinal rule of real estate? Location, location, location. We simply do not have enough housing where people want to live. And where we do have housing, in a lot of cases, there are not other services like shopping, churches, schools, and a transportation network that conveniently connects them. So how can this be? How did this happen? Well, for one, our tastes have been changing over time. The National Association of Realtors does a community preference survey every two years, and they've been doing it for 20 years now. For the last six surveys, or 12 years, the majority of the respondents have said they want to live in compact, walkable neighborhoods. And each year of those surveys, the percentage increases for that desire. Now, add to that some who's asking for that demand. Oh, by the way, they ask for those even if they have to reduce the size of, of their lot in order to live in that community or if they need to live in housing that has multiple units. It's still the overwhelming preferred place to live. So what's driving this change? Oh, the other piece of that, only 14% of our communities across the country are built this way. So what's driving this change are two demographic groups. The American Association of Retired Persons conducted a study, and they found that both millennials 
and boomers want walkable, compact communities. These are the two biggest demographic groups we have in this country, and they're competing for the same market. That becomes problematic. For us boomers, we're retiring later. <laughs> yes. But we're also not retiring the way our parents did. We're staying in, either staying in our homes or we are moving, downsizing a little bit, but staying in our communities because we have contacts and connections and activities that we want to be a part of. We're not moving to senior communities or retirements in warmer climates in the percentages like we used to. We're putting off any kind of nursing home or skill care until either advanced age or physical infirmity, infirmities require that. What does that mean? That means that housing stock isn't flipping like it used to. It's not going on the market. As for the millennials, they're a little bit different. I'm sure I'm not the first TED Talk speaker to say that. They have different tastes than their parents and grandparents. They don't want to acquire things or stuff. They want to invest in experiences, which is why pre-pandemic, travel, tourism, and fast casual dining were the fastest growth sectors. And now, this past summer, it's re-emerged as the tailing winds of the pandemic are on us. That means, again, the two largest demographic groups are all competing for that same walkable, compact development. Now, there's one other piece of demographics that I need to mention. 62.5%. According to the U.S. Census Bureau last year, 62.5% of all households in the United States composed of only one or two people. That's a lot more housing need than we've ever needed in our history for households. And it, this trend is expected to continue. So, we've got these demographic changes, we've got these changes in, in choice and demand. What else is out there? Well, land use regulations and public acceptance of changing housing types are also barriers. Most land use regulations are tied to zoning. Zoning, quite simply, is the regulation of the use of land. It is also the regulation of the intensity of that use of land. And over the past several decades, zoning ordinances for cities have gotten more and more selective, meaning we separate out single-family homes from other uses, and then we separate out single-family homes by size, by lot size, and by type, further creating separation, mostly among income groups. Well, that's one explanation of it. There are two historical points that heavily influence how our cities developed in the last 60 years. World War II, after, in its aftermath, the desire was to get back to normal, to grow families, to get out of the dirty cities. And so the GI Bill was created to encourage home ownership. More families were purchasing their own home forever before in our history. Now, let me put a pin in that it is estimated that 1.2 million African-American veterans were actually denied that benefit. And that is a TED Talk for another day, but a TED Talk indeed. Now back to this wave of home ownership. Pair it with the use of the car. Cars have been around for a couple decades, but with changes in manufacturing and mass production, rising wages, more families could afford them and they could drive to get their needs met, whether it's working or just shopping or whatever. And so, with these two influences, we spread out, and spread out we did, creating very large, disconnected suburbs. Now, that only explains part of it. We need to go back a little further in history to understand the development patterns that we have today that limit our supply of housing. Richard Rothstein, actually, going back further, racial segregation used to be a component of zoning. There used to be zoning districts that were white-only residential. That is, until 1917, the U.S. Supreme Court struck down an ordinance out of Louisville, Kentucky, stating that it interfered with the ability to buy, sell, or rent land to whomever you chose. Civil liberties were not discussed. In 20, 1926, 
landmark case, Euclid versus Ambler Realty, the Supreme Court said zoning is an appropriate use of the police power and separating land uses supports public health, safety, and general welfare. No problem, right? Well, Richard Rothstein, a law professor, published this book in 2017, The Color of Law. And in it, he describes a number of policies and programs that came together that encouraged and reinforced racial segregation and lower quality construction and development. Most people are familiar with the term redlining. These were maps that were produced by the Federal Housing Administration, and it the color coded the areas of risk by community. Green areas were acceptable risk, good risk, red, not good risk, terrible, and everything in between. But what this did is the green areas, developers and builders there got much favorable rates in terms of for their building loans. That meant there were better building materials, and they could afford to do things like landscaping and build trees and public areas. Not so much the further you went down the color palette. And actually, the impact there is also very profound. There are several studies in the past few years that have been published that talk about the difference in heat in neighborhoods. Why are poor neighborhoods hotter than others? And it goes back to the ability to build these, put these trees in place and their maturity. Google that sentence and you'll be surprised. There's at least four major university studies on this topic. But it wasn't just the loans. Lending institutions reinforced this by creating favorable rates for residential, single-family home, white-only subdivisions. They couldn't do it by zoning, so they did it by deed restriction. This meant no apartments, no duplexes or small court apartments were built, which we had traditionally been doing in our neighborhoods. And actually, some believe that is where the seeds were we were planted about rental is something bad for a community. There's one other piece in that. Rothstein points out to an R3 zoning district that was encouraged. Let me decode zoning. R, if it's just R, means residential, usually single family, and three refers to the number of houses you can build on that lot, so three units an acre. That's a pretty spread out pattern. Up until World War II, the least dense district in most communities was R5. R3 was promoted because it would drive up the costs of housing because you had to have more land per house. Therefore, less African Americans could afford to live there. It is insidious and it is still the predominant zoning district for single-family homes in this country today, including my own city. So what can we do about this? Well, there are, I propose three things. One is to embrace density. Now, when a planner says embrace density, the knee-jerk reaction is perhaps she's talking about a poorly built, poorly maintained, poorly managed high-rise that will be full of crime in my neighborhood. And to be sure, there are, some of, there are those that are around the country. But most planners are talking about what we call gentle density increases the ability to build more units, not just three units an acre, and build a collection and variety of housing types in our communities. Dan Parolik is an architect and planner who he and his, his company, Opticos, have been traveling the country and promoting this type of change to zoning ordinances. He coined the term missing middle, which is what is developed in between the single family home and the apartment complex. Those things that we see in other communities and we see in our own older neighborhoods, they are perfectly fit alongside other single family homes. To do this, one has to change not just the regulations, but public acceptance. Public acceptance is not evil, it is fear. And the fear is very simple. For most of us, when we buy a house, it is our single biggest investment of our lives. And we hope it will grow and work for us as we get older, either funding, education, or retirement. You talk about proposing something new into a neighborhood, the concern would be, is this going to fit? Is it going to negatively impact my, the value of my home? 
The evidence so far shows that missing middle infill and developments actually increases the value in the communities they're in. So we need some public acceptance. We need to accept that there are different places that we can call home. The second thing we need is to work on connections. We built these subdivisions and spread out and created individual identities by a single-family housing type. We are not connected and supportive of one another. We create big um, buffers in between these neighborhoods that could have other utility purposes, but also bring us together, because that is in part what our fear is based on. What happens elsewhere could happen here. What if we built communities that were supportive of one another and build a sense of community? Lastly, collaboration. This problem's been around for a while. Planners work on it, housing advocates work on it, neighborhood advocates work on it, elected officials. What if we work together with the same intensity and collaboration to build our communities together, to provide more cho choices, to add to the supply, with the same fervor and dedication that people did during the era of redlining to move us apart and limit our choices? What if we worked together? What if we opened our minds to other possibilities? What if we took a moment and applauded one another for our successes as we make these changes? What if we started today? Thank you. <laughs>